listening to the Twin Theory Podcast, Season 3, Episode 1. Hello and welcome back to the Twin Theory Podcast. We are in Season 3 of the Twin Theory Podcast and we took a month of uh, break before this season, but definitely we want to say thank you to everyone that tuned in to season two, the twin series, where we got to talk about ourselves and just our uh, perspectives, uh, being identical twins and uh, some of the things that we have encountered, the qu common questions that we've gotten, some some really highs and maybe some places uh, that we've struggled and had to learn over the years. Additionally, we had uh, some folks that we got to interview, our parents and our brother, uh, that gave you even more perspective of, you know, uh, their perspective of living with us and growing up with us uh, with, with identical twin sisters. So that was so fantastic. Glad that we were able to uh, share, you know, a little bit of our lives and some of our experiences with you all. And so now... We are into season three, and just like with the change of every season, the overarching theme is twins. Of course, we're, this is Twin Theory Podcast. We talk about everything twins. We're going to continue to talk about twins, but Marissa, did you want to tell them or give them uh, just a little overview of maybe how this season is going to be a little different than uh, last season? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So this season, uh, we're going to go mainstream. So we'll talk uh, all things twins, but we're going to focus more so on mainstream twins. So we'll probably talk about some stories, maybe some wonky, uh, weird twin stories uh, that you may or may not have already heard of, as well as some books and movies that are either already out or might be coming out. Uh, so it's going to be uh, twins that you may be familiar with, or you might be able to even Google some of these stories and look them up afterwards if you're interested. But uh, it'll be all things uh, mainstream. So uh, turning away from Courtney and Marissa and looking at some of the other twins, of course, we'll probably still weave in and talk about some of our experiences as it relates to those twins. But we're going to talk about some of the twins that you may or may not have uh, heard of before. So that'll be this season. Yeah, so so definitely uh, some great some great stuff on the way. I'm I'm very uh, excited about this series and kind of like uh, uh, dissecting, if you will, some of these stories that we're going to talk about and just kind of giving you our point of view. So, without further ado, we will jump into this episode's uh, mm -hmm. theme or overview. And so, in this episode, we are talking about the silent twins. These, this is the oh. story of Jennifer and June. Marissa, did you want to give them a little background on it? Yeah, so they're uh, twins, Jennifer and June Gibbons, and they were born, I believe, in Barbados, and then family moved to Wales. And when they got to Wales, there were some issues with the twins and their communication. They thought some of it had to do with like some of their native dialect intertwining with others, other dialects, if you will, in the area. So a lot of people had a hard time understanding them. But then after a while, that became a full blown issue where nobody could understand them. They only, you know, only they could understand what they were saying to each other. And then I believe their younger sister, Rose, was able to pick up on a few things as well. So with time, it became more so other people could not understand them at all. And only they really had their language uh, between themselves. So uh, as the, the years progressed, um, the, of course, this caused some issues in school and uh, some uh, psychologists were kind of tapped, if you will, to look into the situation. And so they decided that they would try to uh, split the two girls up, Jennifer and June, and put them into two different boarding schools, hoping that that would help the situation. But instead, it got worse because then they both became mute. <laughs> so when they got split, they, they became mute. So they ended up coming back together together. Um, still communicating between each other, uh, but their primary mode of communication, I would say, to the outside world was through writing. So they both were writers um, and they, they were fiction writers um, and their genre was kind of around crime. So they, they wrote about crime and then they, <laughs> they started committing some crimes as well. Um, but during their, their life, they were locked up for a pretty significant amount of time. I believe it was 11 or 12 years. Um, and when I say locked up, I mean hospitalized in a mental institution. 
And uh, there were some uh, concerns from the family and even the twins said as well, uh, they got a longer sentence, if you will, than most because, you know, they were, they were, they were mute and they felt like that was unfair. Anyway, if you read more through their story, you'll see that um, it, it became progressively more and more of an issue for them to where they kind of said that they felt that one of them needed to die, if you will, to free up the other so that they could kind of live their lives openly and freely. Um, so Jennifer was the one that decided she was going to be the sacrifice, if you will. And while the twins were being transported to another, I believe, mental institution, um, Jennifer ended up passing away. And the mystery is how she passed away because still they don't know how. They checked all her like vitals and other other things to see, you know, was it poison or anything like that? And it was nothing that the medical um, staff could find. And June, her sister, was saying that a few days leading up to that, um, she saw some differences with Jennifer, and Jennifer was saying she just wasn't feeling the same. So that whole thing is kind of weird. Um, but after her sister Jennifer died, and June kind of assumed her own life, still a bit of a quiet life, but um, she felt like she was more free. Um, if you will. So that's kind of the story of Jennifer and June. Uh, a weird one. I would definitely say if you have time, you can look into it, read about it. Um, they have, I'm sure, a little many documentaries and that sort of thing, kind of talking about those twins. Yeah. So, so definitely the, the overview kind of to the T. Uh, yes. These twins were very interesting, you know, the, yes. and, and, and not only, I think the overarching kind of theme was like, Hey, they were inseparable to the point that they became, uh, catatonic when they were separated from each right. other. And then once one, once they were permanently separated, like once one died, they, the other one became free, if you will. Right. Right. It's like, <laughs> uh, normal after that, like after right. she didn't have the other two. So yes, fantastic. Great read. Definitely. If you want something to, if you're into, uh, you know, the horror, uh, you should read their books <laughs> or suspense. I don't know about horror. I would maybe suspense right you All know right, well whatever if you're into <laughs> anything suspense horror weird quirky stuff read their books uh very the silent yeah this from the silent twins you can you know definitely mm -hmm. google it and read some of their books um so okay great overview definitely and so <laughs> of course Riz, what do you think about this? What do you think about this whole story? I guess, like, what are your thoughts when you just kind of like look at it and you think, what are your first initial thoughts? I mean, it's definitely weird. I would say what is most interesting is it's not like it was just the two twins in the family, right? They had a younger sister, and then I believe they either had a, an older sister and an older brother, or they at least had some older siblings and a younger sister. So they weren't the only ones in the batch. They seem to be the only ones having the, the speech issues. But what I found was kind of interesting was those, those speech issues didn't come up until they moved to to Wales, and I don't know how old they were. So, you know, if they were babies when they were in Barbados, of course they didn't start talking until they got older when they were in Wales. But it seemed like the speech issues that they seemed to have initially, people could still understand them. It was just that it was it was very fast talking and I guess it was a tie-in of some of the native dialect with some of the new. And so it was difficult in that regard, but I still don't understand how that only impacted them and none of their other siblings. Like you would think that as everybody switched over and everybody kind of integrated into the new language style, if you will, it, it might have been a hiccup for everyone. So I was trying to figure out how it was just really the twins that had that issue. I don't know. Uh, so that I think was the first piece for me. Yeah. So, you know, when I look at this, though, there's a few things that I digest from here. Like you said, they were immigrants. They did move from Barbados to Wales, which is uh, culturally very different. 
Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, they, they were identical twins. So um, I think that identical twins have a lot more of a bond with each other, you know, than I guess your regular sibling bond anyway, just because just from birth, a lot of people, they assume they're the same, that their identities are the same. A lot of things that we discussed, you know, in the last series about twins and being identical twins. And honestly, to me, it kind of makes sense. You know, they're the only black children that are in the school. So they most likely don't have any other uh, friends. And so mm -hmm. uh, they have already been together and communicate with each other uh, at home, probably a lot. But now they're in a, an environment where, you know, we know they're probably facing a lot of things, even like racial racism and all sorts of things. It's 1960s and in Wales that they're experiencing and they have no one to experience this with except for each other. So when it comes to them communicating and them communicating with each other, of course, we know there's a huge language barrier from Barbados to Wales as well. So they might have had some issues with even with even understanding, you know, other students or, or, or teachers or whatnot in Wales because, well, they weren't used to that language. So I think the language barrier really kind of went both ways, but who they could communicate with was themselves. And who could, they mm -hmm. could depend on and that sort of thing were themselves. And there's a few things that's not in the text that, you know, Courtney is just inserting into the text. But, you know, twins in 1964, two black twins, black female twins in an all white environment. I'm sure there were a lot of other pressures and things that they had to that they experienced that they weren't mm -hmm. looked at and it wasn't a oh they're so cute like it is nowadays I'm sure that it was you know looked at very they were looked at and treated very interestingly so when I first look at this I really just wonder uh how much of it is just a misunderstanding potentially of uh some of the administrators and teachers and people around them just them misunderstanding and, and misinterpreting it is, is, is I think what I really want to say uh, because of maybe the social position that they were in at the time. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I would agree with that. I, and it doesn't, you know, the background doesn't speak as much with the family, but I'm still interested in the family part of it because, you know, they weren't living at boarding school. They was living at home. So it would seem like that issue would be more so at school, but at home, within the home atmosphere, they would still be able to communicate among everybody well. So that's where it gets a, a bit interesting, but understood, you know, all those things kind of tying in. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so th that brings me to a thought in that, do you think uh, that twin language is common among twins? And maybe where that comes from, one thing that is mentioned, you know, in this whole story or, or situation is that they kind of came up with their own language in which they could yeah. communicate to themselves and nobody knew what the world they were talking about. Yeah. So, I mean, do I think it's common among twins? Maybe. I know that even within ourselves, mom and dad, even said when we were younger, we kind of had our own sort of communication. And I even think that's a sibling thing, like maybe not even things you say, but it can be nonverbal communications that siblings have and that twins have. So I think that a twin language, yeah, I think it could be common um, among twins where it comes from. You know, that's that's interesting. Um, with twins, I would say b being younger as they grow up, being closer together, you know, the separated separation piece generally occurs as twins get older, at least in our experience. But as you're younger, you're kind of with that twin the whole time. Like if you don't have two different cribs you're in the same crib, you know, just sharing the same bed, sharing the same space. And so since you're around each other a lot, then you're communicating with each other a lot, which can create the opportunity for coming up with your own sort of shorthand or twin language. So I think that portion of it, I mean, I think it's it's probably common for a lot of twins, you know, what, I mean, what, what would you think? What, what do you think? Definitely. I think it's common for twins, but I think it's just, it, it, 
it's rooted in like a principle that like if you're around anybody whether they're your twin or not if you're around anybody or anything for long periods of time like you said you find ways to communicate with each other that maybe everybody or other people can't communicate um you even see this when it comes to maybe certain people and their pets their you know cat their dog or whatever their pet is where they can communicate clearly to their their dog nobody else can you know but they have ways mm -hmm. in non-verbal some verbal some non-verbal ways in which they can communicate to one another and they both understand and so i think in this case it's just that is it, like like you said i think it happens a lot with twins and i think in this case it's the exact same in that um you know these twins found a language that they could communicate to each other in uh because for one i think that they they felt safety with each other you know at least initially mm -hmm. i think they really felt some safety with each other and then that's you know born here is born the twin language i still up until this point of the story don't see where there's any major issues i just think there's a lot of misinterpretations and misunderstanding yeah so okay so to follow that up then uh for for the question that i have then for you is with that in mind, I guess thinking of the the whole story now, you know, in terms of their language being separated, becoming mute, and then how this kind of spiraled, um, would do you think that the communication issues that June and Jennifer had were solely linked to them being twins, or do you think at some point there was some sort of psychological disorder or other pieces that kind of enhance that communication uh, issue, if you will? you know this is very interesting because again we're only getting this story from one point of view we're getting the story from the point of view of the white people that tried to figure out what was going on with these two black twins at the time you know or or the studies that we're getting they come from a majority <laughs> And they are the, mm -hmm. the, the huge minority. And I don't know how much effort was put into really trying to understand them. Therefore, my answer kind of remains the same to this question, that I still don't think that it was anything psychologically wrong with them. Maybe not in the beginning. As the story progresses, I think maybe there were things that potentially could have affected them psychologically. Uh, but they communicating with each other, them having this language, and I don't know that any of that had anything to do with any psychological factors or mental instability factors that started within themselves. Now, it could have been psychological mm -hmm. factors based off of what they experienced or what they were around and how they chose to cope with whatever you know factors were happening uh, to them. That's how I see the story or how I I interpret it. Okay, I think for me, what I would be interested in, and interested in, and this is, would be a follow up. I think this could kind of give more, um, and I think this was their, at least seemingly based on the story, their way of communication was their writing because they did write, and it wasn't that their writing wasn't understood, so people could understand them through their writing. So I think that if you are um, you know, only speaking to one other person, then if you do write, it, it, it does say a lot about what you have to say or your thoughts and other things. So I would be interested to read some of their short stories and, and books and writings to kind of see if that, if there are any telltale signs there as to whether or not they had any kind of other things playing out other than just um, what was portrayed by the community, if you will. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. definitely, I would be interested in seeing even how the characters in their books communicated with each other, you know, like, yeah. and, and, and which way, how people in their stories communicate. Again, I, you know, I will read a book one these days with all the lights on and, you know, all that sort of thing, because it seems like <laughs> these a little eerie. Um, all right. Yeah. It, it could be. Yes. In, in, as we read again i do think that there are some psychological issues and some maybe psychological disorders that they might have i don't want to negate that they very well could have some psychological 
um, issues. But I don't know if they had those from inception from the very beginning, or if that is something that happened based off of maybe things that they were exposed to, or, you know, that sort of thing. There's so much missing in this in you know this entire story which is interesting i guess you know definitely i would be interested to talking to somebody if they've done some in-depth uh, research because there's so many things that are missing that i feel like if we had some of those key factors and some of those key points we could really you know say one way or the other whether this is psychological or whether this is based off of you know their uh society you know that they were in at the time or what they faced on the day to day based off of the position that they were in at the time well you know june gibbon is still alive right she's in her late 50s we always reach out to her to get the inside scoop and maybe and, she'll be in season four you know that's <laughs> a good idea you know actually i am not opposed to sending this podcast re recording to june gibbons in to see if she would like to be on the Twin Theory podcast to maybe talk hey. about, you know, <laughs> maybe talk about her account for, you know, what happened because, yes, yeah, she is still, um, you know, she's, she is still alive. And that brings me, I think, to the next point is that, you know, after Jennifer died, which they, you know, some type of way, rock, paper, scissored, or some, so, some sort of, way they figured out that jennifer was going to be the one to die versus june i don't know what they did to figure that out a fight to the death mm -hmm. i don't know what they did but that that's another question i would have for june um is after jennifer died you know they pretty much said that june was able to live uh more freely she was able to live more freely and uh she became normal you know, quasi normal, mm -hmm. you know, if you will, like, it was like, okay, after that happened, she was freed, and she was okay. And um, do you feel just from your twin perspective, your identical twin perspective, uh, do you find that uh, when we're not together, do you feel more free or independent? Um, because we're not together? So I would say as an adult, I mean, I feel the same when we're together and when we're not together, you know, I don't know if there's a more free or independence. However, when we were younger, I would say, I don't know if the free is the best word, but independent, if you will, when we were separate, because, um, and I know you mentioned it, um, you know, in some of the, in the previous seasons, but there was an expectation when we were together that we did certain things together. So when we were separate, it was kind of like a, a sense of more independence. Now, what I would say, which I mean, it kind of both ways for you um, in terms of your points earlier with the community that they were in and how they were viewed for this with June saying she felt more free and independent. I don't know if to a degree with them being twins and what the twin ratio was there or just with them being twins and being black twins. And the only one, I guess, in that area or that community, there was a fascination surrounded around them where they felt like they couldn't really be free. So they felt that by if one of them, you know, left and they were just independent, then maybe, you know, people would stop if you will, be an ultra fascinated in them, if you will, kind of like the scientists that are like wanting to do all these studies on twins. It's like an ultra fascination towards twins. So perhaps maybe in that community, that's what was occurring. And they felt like the only way to rid themselves of that was for one of them to die. So that's, that's kind of my thoughts with the independent and free. The other piece of that as well is like, well, you know, Again, there could have been other psychological pieces underneath that, because when they went to boarding school, that was kind of like the opportunity to run towards freedom because they split them up, but instead they would mute. So um, or at least based on the story we're getting. So there's a few things there that might negate that that first explanation. But, yeah, I would say for us or at least for me as an adult, I wouldn't really say free, independent. There's a difference when we're together or apart. But when we were younger. I think there was more enhanced feeling of independence because when we were together a lot of people had a 
a twin expectation of us. So definitely, you know, Marissa, I agree and side with you like 100%. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns here. And one thing that I will definitely say, even to your point of the boarding school, um, you know, I would definitely even with that, you know, and they had a chance, I guess, if you will, in boarding school. I don't know, because when we were younger, I felt like we were in a little bit of a box, you know, because I felt like at that point in time, we were supposed to uh, do everything together. And we were supposed to think the same and be the same person because that's who kind of the influence that we had. And so I think that in this case, it could be the same thing, maybe because of those outside influences and the way that, you know, twins were perceived in the 1960s, even though they went to boarding school, they still knew that they were twins. And there's a potential that mentally they were in a box that they felt like they were supposed to still act as twins, um, even though they were separate because they knew that they were twins. But over the years, just like with us, we realized over the years that eh, there's actually no box. We don't have to live in this box of being identical to somebody else. We can be our own person. I feel like that's something that they realized that it was a possibility. They just didn't know how to do that. Because even at the time that Jennifer died, you know, understanding of twins and them being two independent people, that still wasn't a thing. That wasn't a thing until a lot later. And it's still not really a thing. It's just more acceptable now. And so they might have thought that the, like you said, the only way that they could free themselves from that box was that one of them had to go. Now, again, I don't know what game they played that they figured out one of them had to go. And we're going to have to ask June that question. But that I definitely side with you on that view is that, you know, hey, I, I do think that, you know, they were just a, a product of, I don't want to say of their environment, but I, I feel like they, you know, they were really, really, really influenced by the the social norms of the time in society at that time. To a degree. Now, I mean, there's, again, there's two sides to this. I still, and the only part to me that's kind of sitting out there is like, so Jennifer died. We don't know how Jennifer died. Nobody knows how Jennifer died. June's still here now. June ain't said nothing except she ain't know how she died. So I thought it was interesting after they picked straws, figured out who was going to die. Then Jennifer died. But it wasn't readily known how she died. I and she, like, I thought it said something like she suffered some sort of health issue, heart issue, something, some sort of medical condition or instant medical condition that they don't really understand how it occurred. Uh, well, okay. So I, maybe something to that. And we may, you know, there's so many things floating around <laughs> out here about that. But so we don't know. But from, what, from my understanding, though, is they don't know. Is, my understanding was they never knew, like, the, the official calls. Like, girlfriend just popped up dead. How about that? And it just so happened that she was the, trend, the, the, the twin with the shortest straw popped up dead. So that's still the interesting piece to me. Like, well, ain't nobody come forward and said nothing really I mean, I had to look into that and what again, but at least for what I looked at, what I read up, they didn't concretely know how she died. In June, all June said was that she was acting weird a couple of days beforehand, saying she wasn't really feeling good, but then she dropped. You know what I'm saying? And they was like, they ain't find no poison and nothing else. So I think that's the interesting piece too. Like, yo, once you drew that short straw, you was gonna die regardless, baby. So I don't know, I, like that. That's that that, with you. I, you know, I'm saying, I, I, you know, that's, that's a little weird. I, that know, is I weird. Feel, I, I look at this. I still look at this, Marissa, and I think that again, Jennifer dead. She no, can't wait, speak wait, for wait. herself. Wait, 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 wait. Calm down. I still feel <laughs> that there are internal factors that aren't being considered. Because if they were so heightened, you know, frightened to a point that they felt like they would have no individuality living in a world together, that somebody had to die, then I feel like whenever it was determined that Jennifer had to die, that could have been enough of a mental 
breakdown for her to suffer some sort of, you know, internal mental collapse or whatnot to kill her. Maybe she thought that, hey, I am preventing my sister June from being individual, from being herself, from having a regular life because I am alive. And now we have decided that I am the, the, the weakest link. Goodbye. And so she, you know, at that time, mentally and internally, those feelings are all things that she could have been feeling that, uh, that help or associated to what ultimately was her demise, what, what ultimately killed her. That's what I'm saying is that I do understand she just suddenly, you know, to scientific views or whatever died. There was no poisoning. There was no killing, no stabbing, no shooting, anything like that. But mentally, nobody really talks about the psychological reports. Nobody goes into details about what those reports were, what tests were, were conducted on these girls or anything. And so I do feel like there, if you were at a point, if we get to a point where we feel like one of us have to die and then I pull the straw and I have to die, I feel like that's enough to take me out in the course of a few days, just mentally, because I'm just not where I should be. Understood. My counter, and I guess for the listeners, the thing to think about is they had this pact between each other. So nobody else knew Jennifer had the short straw except for June. So we can only take June word that June wasn't the one that really had the short straw. You know what I'm saying? Because it wasn't like a, a public thing where it was like, and then Jennifer decided it was between them two. So all we can take now is the word from the living twin. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, so that, that that's it. I, you know, we'll, we'll let the, we'll let the listeners just kind of, you know, cause it is, this is the interesting story. We'll let the listeners just kind of groove on this one, but that that's my piece too. Like, well, you know, it wasn't a public, you know, rock, paper, scissors. It was ju all of June's works. And June is the living one now. And as to why, who, like who drew the, <laughs> the short straw. So. That, that that that's just my piece but interesting story for sure i hope this has been entertaining for sure for everybody listening now if you haven't read up on it or seen any documentaries this might be a you know a good one for you grab your popcorn yeah this is definitely good and i think this is a good segue to to go ahead and get to a close because we could be here all day talking about this one uh this one is definitely real juicy in in many different ways and i um I, i'm definitely interested in getting some feedback from our listeners and what they think and you know hey you mentioned june is still alive june gibbons is still alive and um you know i'd be very interesting from getting her point of story i don't know if we will ever know what truly happened uh, we know what they said, we know what she said, and then we can just figure out what we actually think that happened. Again, like you said, you made some great, you know, arguments and great points that we don't know. We're just getting the story from one side. We just kind of want to leave our, you know, viewers, of course, we have questions that we leave them with. I, and I do want to just leave them with a simple question. What is your perspective on this June and Jennifer story? What do you think actually happened? Do you think that they suffered from psychological disorders or do you think maybe there were other uh, things that affected them uh, that that maybe we're not paying attention to? Um, so with that, you know, I don't have any, definitely look forward to the, the next episodes. They're all probably going to be very juicy like this one. And, um, yeah, anything you got for us before we head out? Uh, no, that's it. Just, you know, look forward to having a fun season three, season two was fun. So if you have any stories or any, any interesting twin things you've come across or books or documentaries whatever let us know we'd love to kind of dive into that and and look at it i mean i i think it's kind of fun for us because we're like it ain't it won't us <laughs> we just kind of you know observing but also there's pieces to it that i think are are things that we have experienced or that we can't speak to so th this will be a fun season yes i agree uh this will be a very 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 fun uh series and for those that are new uh, to the Twin Theory Podcast, you can find us at uh, Twin Theory Podcasters on Instagram or the, ten the Twin Theory Podcast on uh, YouTube. And feel free to send us emails if you have an email or questions or comments or anything you want to add to this. If you know more about the story or how we can get in contact with June Gibbons, uh, you can email us at twintheorypodcasters at gmail.com. 
So hope you all are having a fantastic summer and we will talk to you all next month.